Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining day three of the COVID-19 Vaccines Unfinished Business Symposium. Today we'll have a roundtable discussion on vaccine equity, distribution capacity building in terms of IP, technology and talent transfer and manufacturing. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's session, Dr. Mark Grodman. Dr. Grodman is an assistant professor of clinical medicine at Columbia University. He is also the co-founder and former CEO of Genocity Inc., a life science biotechnology company that provides novel software, technical, and laboratory solutions to realize the value of precision medicine. Dr. Grodman, thank you for leading us through the day. Carlo, thank you very much. I want to welcome everybody to the third day. This is going to be something a little bit different uh, that we're going to try for the first time. It's going to be a discussion, and I am really thankful that we have a group of panelists who are willing to uh, take the chance to be part of this rather novel process. You know, vaccines have had an incredible impact on COVID. Um, it's changed all of our lives. It's changed how we live, that of loved ones. It's had an impact maybe beyond any other intervention, any other pandemic that's ever occurred in our lifetimes. But what we also do realize is that COVID has had an incredible impact on vaccines. You know, the program in vaccine education started with conversations that those of us at Columbia had at first with Katherine Jensen from Pfizer. And that was in 2019, well before COVID. And it was there with a group of vaccinologists, um, not me, but I was there, promoting the fact that vaccines have had incredible impact over the years affecting so many lives, the impact on children, I mean, has been overwhelming. Yet there was very little excitement about the field itself. That the question that Catherine raised was, where are the young people who would be excited to come into the area? Well, COVID has impacted vaccines. It's brought attention to the mission, to the possibilities more than ever before, more than many vaccinologists would have ever thought of five years ago. It's an opportunity. But what we want to talk about today, and, and because of that, the issues that have always been there are now are more pronounced than ever. Equity, access, innovation, responsiveness to new pathogens, all of them which have been talked about for years, which have been funded for years, now is grading more impetus to go find solutions. Some of those solutions have talked about how local, regional efforts to be able to do this. New infrastructures, new manufacturing infrastructures could be able to go in and help solve the issue to equity and access. Well, as we've talked about before, the devil is in the details. And we're going to talk, we're going to talk today a little bit about the devil. I just want to make it very clear that in no time are we aligning with the devil. The mission remains the same. How do you promote equity, access for all groups, for all areas? How do you respond to new emerging pathogens, whether or not they're in developed areas or not? And what mechanism can we do to be able to, can we adopt to be able to do that? Any new initiative is very much like a new business. It may be funded philanthropically. It may be funded as a priority for as a national priority, but they will still have to answer the same questions. What are you gonna make? What vaccine is there? Are we talking about just COVID? Are we talking about facilities for new variants? Are we talking about a new pan-coronavirus vaccine? Or are we talking about, for nationalistic purposes, that if we only live with private companies making vaccines, are we talking about repurposing or now local manufacture of existing vaccines? Are we talking about facilities and capabilities for new emerging pathogens? What are you going to make? Who's going to pay for it? Is it all philanthropic? Is it repurposing money that's now being spent? And, and if it is, how do you deal with the very difference of what the cost might be? 
depending on what you're going to make, how are you going to transfer the technology from those who know it to those who are learning? And in so doing, to be able to do that, the realization, the fact that the more you do, the more platforms you have, the harder it is. Talent. Where do you find the talent to be able to go in and do it? How do you compete for the talent? IP. For many of the conversations we have, people kind of say, you know what, let's adopt the TRIPS waiver. And I have to apologize to my dog in the background. Um, just let's adopt the TRIPS waiver and we'll resolve it. It's more complicated than that. Julia will talk about that, that there's more proprietary rights than IP. Regulatory validation issues. But the point is, we have an opportunity to solve it. And we need to be able to go deal with those issues, with those details. Because if there is an opportunity to resolve these issues, we don't want to blow it. We want to make sure that the initiatives are going to be well thought out and funded and be able to be most primed for success. We have an extraordinary panel that we're going to talk about these issues today. For sake of time, I just would like to be able to go around and to be able to introduce them. Julia Barnes Weiss is the executive director of the Global Healthcare Innovation Alliance. She's an attorney. She is someone who has worked as a co-founder of her nonprofit, has worked as a consultant to WHO, has worked um, as a legal consultant to SEBI, and is an understanding and has an understanding of one of the more critical aspects of licensing, which is part and parcel to any, any private public partnership. Scott Dowell is in charge of uh, the COVID response of the Gates Foundation, has had a story, has had a storied career at the CDC where he responded in Haiti to the earthquake and the cholera outbreak dealt with emerging pathogens in Thailand, retired as a rear admiral, 140 publications over the years, um, has left his mark on this area. Martin Fried, somehow I think that any, any initiative that's done around the world in vaccines, he somehow knows or is involved in. He's worked as in vaccine development and has a global view that few others do. Resh Machete, Few people go in and get, um, what was one of the things that you had talked about? One of the people who will own the future, is that one of eight people a few years ago, but is also not only an outstanding engineer, is CEO, COO of an innovative public company, Ginkgo Bioworks, that makes new technologies real, that trans has been involved, that transfers technology and finds a way to make those ideas realistic outcomes. Um, Gangadeep Kang Cherry, if you will, is a notice infectious disease expert who has advised the Wellcome Trust, the WHO, has been a resource and brings in a very unique perspective, not only for the global view, but with the experience over in Southeast Asia and just what it takes to build full service vaccine facilities and capabilities. And Monsef Slowry, I think everybody knows Monsef clearly for his work in Operation Warp Speed, but for 30 years, he had multiple positions in GSK, including running vaccines and oncology and R&D. And Monsef was on our panel last year where he talked about just the experiences that went in to Warp Speed. I just will, don't believe enough credit's been given to the remarkable work that was done I've learned in business a long time ago that people don't often study success and failure. They think that everyone involved in success is very smart and knows everything. I think that everyone who fails doesn't know anything at all. Well, the reality is that when people succeed, there are factors and there are reasons why. And when they fail, there are reasons why they fail and that's how you learn. And the success of Operation Warp Speed is that all the components that were necessary were covered. And finally, um, Krishna Udaya Kumar, um, who was from Duke, 
was the founding director of the Duke Global Health Innovation Center. His whole career has been based on trying to be able to go in and find solutions to having innovations be adopted for worldwide use. He is involved as in a nonprofit as executive director of the Innovations in Healthcare that was funded by Duke McKinsey and the World Economic Forum, has appeared in multiple peer reviewed journals and has really gone in and talked about the impact of transformative health solutions on a global basis. If anyone can go in and dance with the devil of the details, it's gonna be this group. So I wanna start this off. This is an open exchange. Questions are open. I will start with it and I will ask all of you questions, but please feel free to comment. Kumar, I wanted to go start with you. You've looked very much on the evolution of both vaccine equity and the need to be able to look at local manufacturing and local initiatives as part of the solution. Maybe you can talk to us a little bit about how that's evolved, where that is, and some of the roadblocks that you see. Sure, thanks, Mark. Such a pleasure to be part of this conversation today. And I'll try to set perhaps a bit of context and love to, to get the conversation going from there. So for us to reflect just on where we are with the pandemic, if we just look at reported cases, we're over five, around 500 million cases and over 6 million reported deaths. And we know that that's a massive undercount. The best model we see is probably 18 to 20 million deaths around the world at least. And, uh, and so we're nowhere near the end of this pandemic, but we do know that it's highly dynamic and highly regionalized in the way that it plays out. Um, when it gets to vaccines as a, as a critical tool to end the pandemic and control it in the longer term, uh, we have seen astonishing scientific accomplishments, the fastest development of a new effective and safe vaccine in history, uh, massive um, scaling up of manufacturing. Prior to the pandemic, the global capacity for vaccine manufacturing was probably somewhere in the order of 5 billion doses a year. And we saw in 2021 over 10 billion doses just of COVID vaccine uh, being developed and, and shipped. So a massive scale up in a very short period of time. And uh, right now we've seen 11.2 billion doses of vaccine administered in over 180 countries. And COVAX as a multilateral platform to support vaccine equity has been able to ship more than 1.4 billion doses to 144 countries. While those are all significant accomplishments, when we look at markers of global access and global equity, we know that we have much work to do. If we just compare low-income countries to high-income countries and upper-middle-income countries, there's a tenfold difference in uh, administration of vaccines, about 20 doses per 100 people in low-income countries and close to 200 doses per 100 people now in high-income and upper-middle-income countries. And we know that that's not a, an acceptable level of inequity um, relative to where we are in the world. If you look at the entire continent of Africa, we're at about 15% of that population of 1.3 billion people fully vaccinated. The World Health Organization set an interim goal of 40% vaccination in every country by the end of December last year. And we know that 90 countries missed that target. Um, so there are many, many reasons that we're, we find ourselves in this position of unacceptable global inequities. One of them is access to critical products like vaccines, and that gets to manufacturing. I think we've seen that um, there is a pretty strong correlation between the sites of manufacturing and earlier access to vaccines that have played out over the last year or so. Uh, we've also seen that um, there is a movement toward a more globally distributed model for vaccine manufacturing, both to deal with some of the challenges of consolidation as well as regional access uh, in this time. We're starting to see the unlocking of some of those models. For example, the Partnership for Vaccine Manufacturing in Africa, led by the Africa CDC and African Union. We're starting to see um, movement in the WHO-supported mRNA hub in South Africa. We've seen voluntary licensing supported by public financing and other support uh, in deals um, 
supported by the U.S. Development Finance Corporation with BioE and J&J in, in India, for example, or with Aspen more recently in South Africa. And we're starting to see some other, other models of public-private partnership, with, like what Moderna has announced in, in Kenya. So we have clear challenges. We're starting to see a bit of progress, but nowhere near enough in terms of the scope and the urgency. Uh, and um, with that, I'll maybe... Uh, stop and, and bring in the other folks and, and Mark, turn it back to you to talk about, you know, why we find ourselves in this position and where we go from here. Great. Krishna, thank you very much. Martin, you are aware um, of a lot of what's going on and a lot of the ideas that are out there. I kind of wanted to get you started earlier on. Um, let me get your reactions to some of the initiatives that are going on now around the country to be able to go in and do regionalized, more decentralized, uh, you know, manufacturing facilities. I'm just gonna let you go because I think I'm gonna comment on oh. what you read. Oh, okay, so Mark, fantastic that you began off with saying, you know, the devil, the devil's in the detail. And let's not side with the devil, but if you don't know where the devil is, you're going to meet him on your way. And that's not always a nice experience. So I'd like to take us back to, to the mid to, to 2005, okay? There was at that time a, a avian, high pathogenicity avian influenza outbreak. And a lot of countries around the world, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, also Brazil said, you know, it's not fair. You guys in the North, you've got, you've got these vaccine technologies. We don't. If there's a pandemic, we need those technologies. So then it was recognized that the countries, which has just been said, the countries that don't have vaccine production, they're going to be the last in line to get vaccines. We saw that in, H in 2009, H1N1. Those countries that didn't have vaccine production, they got the vaccine when the, when the pandemic was over. But anyway, 2005, the world set out, a lot of support from the US government, to build vaccine, pandemic influenza vaccine production technologies around the world. And this was quite successful. But then we met the devil along the way. And the devil, I will point out, was one company in one country that built a nice facility, was able to produce pandemic flu vaccines and seasonal flu vaccines. And we got a call from the minister sometime later and said, can you please tell us why we're paying $6 a dose for our seasonal flu vaccine when we can buy it from a well-known manufacturer for $2 a dose? And we said, well, that's what you pay for your national health security. So let's come to the, the devil. The devil here is that the annual routine demand is a, for a, a birth cohort of about 130 million. When a pandemic comes along, it's 7 billion. And so we need to be able to respond to the 7 billion, but using a market that's set up for 130 million. And this is where the devil is. So, when we talk about trying to build capacity in the low and middle income countries, so for example, the, tech, the, 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 the pro program that I'm leading about the mRNA technology transfer, this has got to be seen in the light of, yes, we can give you the technology. Yes, we can train your workforce to be able to absorb the technology. Yes, we can get your regulatory agency up to speed. But, and this is where the devil is, but what are you going to do after the pandemic or in between pandemics to keep this technology warm. And I think this is something I'm really going to just point to Monsef, that GSK many years ago was trying to look at facilities that could be built and maintained warm. And we really have to think about this the same way that countries think about armies. It's not a good time to be mentioning armies and defense, but essentially what we're talking about here, it's national health security, the same way that we talk about national security, that you have to have an army that is trained, that is ready to respond. But in between wars, that army actually doesn't do a lot, hopefully. So to come back to these activities going on, they're all very good. We need to move on this because it is essential that those regions of the world that don't have vaccine production capacity do acquire it. But the devil, the devil that we will meet along the way is who is going to pay to put this up? That we can manage, there's donors there. But once it's established, who is going to pay to keep it warm? And this is where we're going to run into the problem that it's got to produce something on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. And, and that's the challenge. And, and just going back, I just want to, 
you have to start out is that, and what are you going to make? There are multiple initiatives all over Africa that are multiple ones that are trying to go in and make vaccines. There are collaborations with private companies that are private enterprises that are doing local manufacturing, whether it be collaboration with China, with Russia, with Moderna, with, you know, with BioNTech, anyone. These are for COVID. You have others that are looking at more ambitious plans to say, you know what, why should Africa take 25% of vaccines or the world's global supply, whatever the number is, and make, you know, low single digit percentages of supplying it themselves? We want to do that ourselves. Well, this is a different ball game. It's a different infrastructure. We'll talk about that. Um, you Can have I to know, Mark, I was, just, I was just going to jump in and ask on, on Martin's point about armies. It's, it's so compelling to say that countries really should be thinking about uh, vaccine manufacture as a kind of a security issue and pay for any, as, as you said, people don't criticize paying for armies because they're not fighting a war. Uh, you just expect that you have to pay for your army, even whether they're fighting a war or not fighting a war. But um, on, on these uh, public health issues, we turn to public health financing. I, it, we, we talk about non-ODA or non-overseas development assistant funding uh, as important in this area, but I don't know, is there any progress? To, are there countries that are actually getting security funding um, allocated for uh, just in case vaccine manufacturing? Is there any progress towards that? Because it's, it's talked about a lot over the years and it's, it's hard to see examples of where countries are actually willing to put security funding towards, or maybe Mansa has, has, has examples of that from, from your experience. Yeah, I guess. <clears throat> so, um, hi everyone. Uh, great uh, to participate here with you. Uh, maybe a comment regarding, yes, indeed, uh, you, know, you know, manufacturing facility is useless if it's not running on an ongoing basis. And if it's running on an ongoing basis, whatever technology you have transferred to it, it's going to be used to manufacture vaccines that may compete uh, and I'm going to talk about the devils here and right? just put it on the table that may compete with the business that has transferred that technology as part of a participation to global health and public health uh, and in effect uh, be counterproductive to the business and its capacity to be um, a profitable business or a, uh, a, a business can be, that can be maintained over time. So the very rationale that is put forward to transfer technology out of appropriate, uh, uh, I would say, requirements to protect global health contains in it a challenge to the industry that has spent significant monies to innovate with a new platform, let's say now the messenger RNA, that's a really, really almost 100% platform in other words, if you make vaccine number one, you know how to make vaccine number 100 and everything in between. Uh, uh, you know, you're you're going to undermine the capacity of the business to have a payback on the investment they have made over 10 years. We need to find a solution to that. And the solution, in my view, is somewhat similar exactly to what's happening with, with the army and the armament industry. Uh, which is not actually localized in many countries, is incredibly high technology uh, uh, requiring uh, and innovation requiring. Uh, and yet is, it is understood from the manufacturers and from the countries that there should be access and appropriate access. Uh, and of course, it comes with bargaining uh, and, and you know, other geopolitical considerations. But every army in the world is accessing certain types of, of uh, armament manufactured in certain countries. Uh, uh, and the more high tech, the more restricted the number of countries manufacturing. So I want to also introduce a second point here, which is there are two types of manufacturing for vaccines, of course. There is a primary manufacturing and there is a secondary manufacturing. 
if I look at what happened with operation with, with the, the COVID pandemic, there were issues at both level, both levels, the level of primary manufacturing, which is to make the bulk vaccine, but also issues around the fill finish, the syringes, the, the needles, the capacity to actually, uh, yeah, in, in an appropriate way, fill finish vaccines and, and distribute them into the countries. And I think one of the possible ways forward to build the confidence and the systems that may allow for broader access to manufacturing capacity across the world should be, uh, if you will, uh, if you will, a thought through approach to secondary manufacturing that is much more generic, you know, fill finish of sterile product can be relevant to many different vaccines and many different uh, medicines. Uh, and, and maybe uh, at a less expanded geographically level, uh, the manufacturing of bulk uh, product with those uh, 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 new technologies, particularly very fast and, and you know, platform technologies. Great. Sherry, let me ask you a question. You, you have experience worldwide in development of vaccines. You have a lot of experience, great deep knowledge of what in your own country um, has done, including the capabilities, you know, the overnight success, if you will, of Serum Institute of India and the capabilities. Since many of the new initiatives talk about owning all capacities in multiple platforms, what would it be like in another area of the world to duplicate that 40 year uh, capability or you know, infrastructure that Serum Institute of India has done? Well, I think it's important to recognize that none of this was overnight. The first um, technology transfer to Serum Institute that resulted in programs was about 20 years ago with the Menafrivac project. And that kind of gave Serum an appetite for being able to move beyond what were then the routine childhood vaccines. They didn't go big, they went step by step. They got the rotus, uh, ro what is now Rotasil from the National Institutes of Health. They started to work on a pneumococcal product. They started to work on HPV, both of which one is licensed and one is pretty close. Um, they started to work with recombinant BCG but all still not new technologies. When COVID-19 hit, Serum didn't think about making its own vaccines. It went out shopping for partners and the first partnership was with Podogenex, which is still a product that has not moved forward. But what they did and what Bharat Biotech did was look for multiple partners using multiple platforms. Um, Serums now has two products that it can make at scale, Covishield and Provavax, where you have technologies that are AstraZeneca's and Novavax's. And Bharat Biotech has an inactivated platform with an adjuvant that also came from the US and uh, is working on new technologies now. So Serum's success was definitely not overnight, but was a 20 year evolution. And Gavi, the global markets really played a huge role in allowing Serum to even think about scale. And it wasn't like there weren't missteps in these two years either. They were not able to scale Kobe Shield at the rate that they thought they would be able to. So it was a much slower process. And it required a certain amount of... So I will say that Serum has a lot of deep capacity when it comes to manufacturing and to being able to set up facilities that can manufacture a lot of doses of vaccine. They have good fill finish capacity, but in terms of 
actual R&D, they are very limited and without technology transfers, it would have been extremely challenging for Serum to do what it did. Will this be repeatable in, let's say, Africa? Well, Martin is going to tell us all about that. Uh, I think there are huge challenges to scale. Doing things at a pilot level, setting up um, you know, enough of a GMP facility to be able to make vaccines for clinical trials is one part of the puzzle. But scaling so that you make millions or hundreds of millions or billions of doses is a completely different ballgame. And we saw that with companies that are experienced, like Pfizer, for example. Took them a while to get going, too. Yeah, that's great. Reshma, you've had experience in the very nitty gritty of technology transfer. You've done this for areas. Could you talk a little bit about what are the necessary components for, within, specifically for mRNA vaccines, your experience with technology transfer? What are the components that are necessary for a successful transfer? And where are the pitfalls? Where do the problems kind of, you know, becomes where the problems outweigh the solutions? Yeah, great question. And, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this discussion. You know, I would say, um, there's sort of several layers of things you need to be able to do uh, distributed uh, manufacturing. Um, you know, obviously you need the obvious things like the manufacturing facility itself, um, but you also need a trained workforce to be able to run that facility. And I, I would echo the comments I already made that, you know, it's not possible to have a facility that's just sitting there that you only spin up, uh, you know, in times of need, it has to be able to operate continuously. Right. Um, and, um, and so even irrespective of funding, just maintaining that trained workforce and, and maintaining the ability to manufacture is important. It only happens if it's, if it's continuously in use. In addition to that, you need the supply chain, right? Um, and I think sometimes uh, that gets uh, a little bit overlooked, but you know, even, even Moderna and Pfizer you know, have, have made public comments about the challenges of getting enough uh, you know, of the kind of core reagents and consumables and materials that they needed uh, to spin up. And so if, if these companies are having trouble, like think about this in, in other countries where, you know, everything from, you know, customs challenges to, to, to you know, shipping um, can, can be problematic. You also need to think about the manufacturing process itself. Um, I mean, you mentioned the TRIPS waiver, but, you know, from my perspective, patents are actually only a small part of what you need to actually do manufacturing. Um, there's a lot of kind of um, unpatented know-how that comes in when you're actually trying to make a vaccine. And so, you know, I think thinking, talking and thinking about patents themselves is a little bit of a red herring in my view, because so much of the knowledge of how to actually manufacture um, these vaccines is sort of embedded in the SOPs and the processes. And so if you want to actually have a tech transfer, you need a full tech transfer of all of the intellectual property, unpatented and patented, right, um, to be able to successfully manufacture at scale. You need to be able to have the quality control procedures, right, to be able to make, make, uh, make these vaccines. You need the regulatory and compliance expertise so that you're in compliance with both the local regulations, but also wherever you have you want to, you plan to actually sell and distribute the vaccine, right? Um, and um, and and so there's kind of a lot of layers to being able to actually kind of successfully uh, um, manufacture vaccines in, in different locations. And, and I think you're only going to have success if you sort of think about all of, and plan for all of those layers. Great, Reshma, thank you. All of you have made my my job so much easy, so easy, because now you led exactly for me to go talk to Julie about, you know, I don't, I don't think you've ever, you know, the topic of IP has ever been described as a red herring before. <laughs> but we'll give it a shot. But clearly, it's, I'm looking forward to it because I think this leads into, I know your feelings about that, you know, it takes, it's more than IP, but the IP in itself has to be considered. So Reshma just said probably the first five minutes of what I was going to say. So thank you very much. I can, I can move on, um, which is it's complicated. And back to the devil is in the de detail. So first of all, disclaimer, I'm not a patent attorney. Um, and if I am anything, it is both a 
a practitioner and a student of global health agreements. Um, and, and speaking of the devil is in the details. Most people um, would about as much read a patent as they would to read a contract. And every piece of what you've talked about today is connected by contracts. Um, and if you can't reach an agreement on the wording that's going into an agreement um, and how that is actually going to be performed and owned by the owners of that agreement, the, the, um, the parties involved in that agreement, then it's not going to happen. Um, and you can't figure out later on whether it was successful or not. So uh, my part of the, the dealing with the devils almost every day is, is the agreements and what needs to go in there. So I will say IP is very often a component of those agreements. I think it is looked at and has sort of become a catch all for a simple solution to what we've all started talking about as an incredibly complicated problem. Um, so just to go up one level again to, I think we're all trying to solve um, a problem which has a lot of problems within it. But I think it's two aspects when you talk about COVID-19 um, vaccines. One is the insufficiency of global supply. Um, and the second is the timing or the delay in vaccines um, being made available to all the populations that need them. Um, and, and if that's the case and where international law doesn't provide the path or the solutions, then it's through consensual agreements. And I think um, Sir Jeremy Farr said on Monday, um, that the path is, is through partnerships and by necessity partnerships through uh, commercial enterprises. And I believe Monsef was pointing out among others um, how there can be conflicts with buying your global health products and vaccines through a commercial enterprise that has um, other motivations and other goals in, in many cases. So um, what I would say is there's a number of different kinds of IP. And just to very oversimplify for a minute, there's background IP um, where these uh, platforms and um, what's necessary to go into actually making the vaccine at the end of the day is owned by a number of parties and um, vastly usually predates the actual development and manufacture of the vaccine. So you're talking about a lot of parties, not just the actual vaccine manufacturers at the end of the day and needing access to um, that background knowledge as well, all the way through to what Reshma said, which is the, um, the unpatented know-how, um, proprietary information that's going to, at the final end, need to be transferred to partners uh, in, in different regions that need to make it. So the, the other thing I think that when we talk about the waiver that people don't consider is the upstream um, IP um, and that can be a delivery system or something else that is involved in this. So in, in summary, there are so many different types of IP and there's so many different owners of this IP that in order to actually transfer all of the rights that are needed, you need to have the cooperation of a lot of different organizations. You have to have um, um, incentives. And if it's not IP, so IP is both an incentive in many cases, both for development, but also for investment, is also really the, the, the currency, if you will, of transactions. So bringing us back to partnerships. Uh, IP and know-how and, and capacity are all different currencies. And these all have to come together to fund and make possible the partnerships that result in vaccines. Um, for my question, I guess this is for Martin, is my question is, can these all come together in a timely enough way to impact both the availability of vaccines and uh, especially for COVID-19 and, and the um, timing um, in order to accelerate in the future, both for COVID-19 future vaccines, but also um, additional, especially pandemic vaccines 
to be available to all of the countries that need them um, uh, in a way that's going to solve this problem? Or is this a problem beyond public-private partnerships? So I'll stop there for now. Thank you. That's great. Okay, Martin, I think she asked you the question. <laughs> okay, so I, I thought there was just one devil. I just realized there's actually lots of devils. <laughs> yes. So Julie, ex excellent. Was the, was the conglomerate. Ex excellent, <laughs> excellent thoughts. Let me just, just bring up a, a, a few comments. So um, I'm, I'm probably on record in various parts of the world of saying IP is not the barrier. It's IP management that's the barrier. So in many parts of the world where we are trying to build capacity, actually there's no IP because the originators, be it the Pennsylvania University, Arbitus, Acuitas, et cetera, they only file their patents in the high income countries. So in these lower or low income countries, the IP is not the barrier. But even there we have discovered to our horror that there are some countries that don't have substantive examination. In fact, they don't have examination at all. And so there we've got patents that have been granted, which to all intents and purposes claim a vaccine that comprises one carbon, one oxygen, and one nitrogen. I'm exaggerating. Okay, it contains mRNA. So we've got these challenges. And then this is where a waiver could be useful, okay, or, or compulsory licensing. However, this does not solve the fundamental problem of sustainability, because if you've only got a license, a partnership, whatever, for production of a COVID vaccine or a pandemic influenza vaccine, or a vaccine against a disease or public health emergency of international concern, what are you going to do with that technology the rest of the time if you don't have the right to produce, use that technology for, I don't know, what cancer therapy, uh, influenza, TB, malaria, HIV, et cetera. So the partnerships were probably essential I think the low and middle income countries have an opportunity now, the same way that India actually was able to use certain opportunities because IP had not been filed there in the past. This gives opportunities. But um, there is the challenge of saying, do I have freedom to operate now? And do you actually have all of that necessary know-how? And most of the low and middle income countries, people do not have the skill sets to be able to say, what do I want to make? What IP will I need to negotiate a license to to be able to make it? We see even now some of the big companies, I will name them Moderna, being sued by other companies for not having a license to certain piece of technology. So what's going to happen then in Zimbabwe or other countries? But then will I have freedom to operate next week? Because there are patents being filed right now which will only surface next week or in 50 or, or 18 months time. And then there's another 18 months while they can undergo national filings. So there is a huge IP uncertainty. And this means that the countries that want to do this are going to have to go back to old technology or as many of them are doing, license in from biotech companies. And this is actually what is happening right now. So the mRNA hub is proceeding with one technology, but desperately in negotiation with biotech companies to license in next generation technologies to be able to be certain of having freedom to operate in all the LMICs. So I don't know that that answers the question, but everything you said, I agree with, yes. <laughs> But I have, a, I have a little bit of a provocative question, uh, perhaps for you, Martin, and, and you, Julie, which is, let's pretend, you know, Zimbabwe didn't have freedom to operate, but chose to proceed anyway. Like, what, what do we think would happen? You know, like, they deem that there's a global health need. They say, oh, we're just going to manufacture. We realize we may not have complete freedom to operate, but we're going to proceed anyway. Um, what, what do we think would happen in that scenario? Let, let me bring up my, my, my points here. So number one, there is you know, there's the trips flexibility. So a, a country can issue um, compulsory licensing under trips. So you know, there is, there is, the patents never become an absolute barrier. So ideally, you negotiate a, a, a license. If you don't get it, you issue a compulsory license. You know, that's, that's an option. Question is, do you know what technologies you need a license to, or do you wait until you're being sued? Okay, so these, these are options in front of you. Biotechs do exactly the same thing every single day. The second part, however, is more complicated because if you've built a facility to be able to do this, you would have had to do some assessment of your IP freedom first. And if you haven't 
built that facility, then when the, when the public health emergency of international concern starts, it's a bit late to start building that facility. So what we're looking at right now is trying to build capacity today, able to respond tomorrow. And our big worry, the devil, is how do we get from today till tomorrow without these things becoming rust? And that's not got a lot to do with IP, but it has a bit to do with IP. Yeah, more, than, think, one, more than one detail. <laughs> I think, well, if Martin pointed out one thing, which is a lot of this is about sustainability. Um, and you're not going to get funders to fund the development of a manufacturing facility um, in a regional manufacturer. So, you know, a, a development bank type funder, unless they feel that both there's the capacity for that facility to make it but also that there is not going to be an end point. And that's also a, a problem with the waiver. It, you know, if, it is in, if it ends in a time, if you pick a time, say five years down the road and the waiver goes away, then what's the answer to what happens with that IP? So uh, an investor may not want to invest because you're capping perhaps the usefulness of that facility. And the, um, and the, the owner of that IP is concerned about what happens uh, with their business. And, and again, one of the things we haven't really said is the IP is usually not for that specific vaccine alone. It is underlying a platform. So the commercial business, especially for a smaller biotech company, may be totally built on that IP. Um, and, and taking the certainty out of what they have takes their funding away, potentially, but probably. I've certainly seen companies that were very worried about that or their investors were very worried about it. And so it, it, is, it is also the kind of replicability of this. So if you, if you take away IP, let's say, assuming you could figure out what it is, to your point, Martin, if you can figure out what it is, and you could say, okay, that IP is not going to work uh, as an incentive or a fundraising basis for your business for five years. And then it is, what does it do to your business? And what does it do to the future ability of that company or willingness of that company to come back in as a partner? Because unless you think that governments can fully make all of the vaccines necessary for global health needs, then you are going to need commercial partners. So I think that's one of the big risks there. It's like, be careful what you wish for, because the end result may be more negative than you anticipate over the next five years. And I will just briefly say, I think the, the quad proposal, I'm not sure, I guess it's a proposal at this point in time, is a really good illustration of that. The parties that propose the waiver don't like the proposed solution that's in the quad solution. Um, and, and so I think it is very difficult to come to uh, a workable definition of what would be waived, what happens at the end of that waiver, and how do you provide incentives for companies whose property rights, shall we say, have been limited um, through the waiver language so that they will both still have commercial potential based on their platform, but also be willing to be partners for future epidemics and pandemics. So that's what keeps me awake at night. I Bye. can see that. Scott, uh, you, you've all made this so easy for me. Talking about funders, <laughs> how, how do funders who want to be able to, who are mission driven, who understand the need, how do you, you know, how can you assure the success of the initiatives in that you do fund and support? when you know there are all of these devils or these details that are out there that may somehow may not be initially understood or seen, but clearly are going to go hit these initiatives down the line. How do you deal with that uncertainty? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's, no, it's tough. I mean, uh, uh, the Gates Foundation is clearly interested in supporting local and regional manufacturing of, of vaccines. It's a, it's a big thing of what we're all about. And fortunately, we have like smart people here. I, I think people like Dave Robinson who can think about vaccine manufacturing in detail and, and, and Natalie Ravel who can think about the contracts and the IP in, in detail. But uh, when we're thinking about supporting 
Institute Pasteur uh, in Senegal uh, for uh, domestic vaccine manufacturing. The short term is a lot easier than the long term. In, in the short term, we kind of look at things like, um, do they have a clear plan for what they're going to do? Uh, is it compelling? You know, are they going to start with things like what Cherry was highlighting on Serum Institute with um, fill finish and uh, bite off a, a manageable chunk? Um, do they have financing and partners lined up that's more likely to make that successful? Are they going to be able to recruit in the, uh, the workforce that's going to make that work in the short term? Uh, so those things can be answered, but in the longer term, then you get into these bigger questions that uh, you're, you all are raising, like, um, is this place going to be able to compete on costs with Serum Institute of India over the years? Um, and those are a lot tougher questions. And I don't, I don't know that we have a <laughs> answered those questions in making these investments, but um, I would also say that... Um, in philanthropy, we're encouraged to swing for the fences. I, I know Warren Buffett used to always say, you know, you guys need to be swinging for the fences. If you're not striking out, you're not swinging hard enough kind of thing. And the, that um, philanthropy needs to be willing to step in and, and help with risks where governments or private industry might not want to do that without us. And so we, we do try and figure some of these things out and try and see where in this environment we can help things out. But it's, it's, it's a very difficult question. <laughs> yeah. Kumar, you've been quiet since the outset and, you know, you spent a lot of your time thinking about these issues. I don't know whether we've covered all the pitfalls that you've encountered, but do you want to comment? I'd love to jump in and, and perhaps pressure test a couple of the things that, that we've been saying. I don't disagree with any of these things, but we've done lots of really complicated things, right? So why haven't we taken this on? We've talked about all the details that are necessary, but it's not as if developing COVID vaccines was easy. And that's why we did it. It's because it was necessary. So somehow amongst the people who hold power and access to money, we've decided for two years, it's not important enough to do. And I think we should recognize that it's not just because it was technically impossible. And on sustainability, I might make two points to pressure test with folks. Absolutely, in the long term, sustainability is important. But if we're going to continue this military analogy, I don't think in 1940 and 1941, when there was war mobilization, they were thinking about how do we maintain sustainability of this in five or six years? It was how do you win the war? And unless we have that same mentality, we're losing trillions of dollars of economic activity and millions of lives. If that's not enough reason to do everything possible, is that the time to really be thinking about sustainable ever, you know, evergreen or ever brown facilities in 10 years? So I would, I would argue that sustainability is important, but that can't be the driving factor of ending a pandemic. And secondly, the around sustainability, uh, there are tweaks we can make on the supply side, but the real game changer is going to come on the demand side. So until Gavi, UNICEF, until ministries of health are procuring and making commitments to procure vaccines from manufacturers locally, regionally in low and middle income countries, we're not gonna shift the dynamics. And that is, is where I would argue we need to see more movement. And then the last piece I'd love to get thoughts on is around the TRIPS waiver. I, I, I've been on record, we've been on record making many of the same arguments that it's technically not perhaps the right solution but I'd love for this conversation to go to the next level. I don't think it's the fact that a hundred countries are supportive of it because they misunderstand what it is. So what do we think is the actual motivation behind that TRIPS waiver? Um, and what is it that's not being met by the current solution that we've got over a hundred countries that are trying to find any levers possible to look at the power dynamics by which trade occurs and the inequities by which we give access to life-saving therapies. Mark, can I play you for a minute? Please. So Krishna, I mean, great, great points. And, and I'd like to ask you, and, and I think Scott, but anybody else, um, fundamentally, who is responsible for making sure that global health products, and in particular, when we're talking about pandemics and the future pandemic to come, who's responsible for paying for those things, 
um, making sure that they are available and making sure that the impediments and if, if a patent situation is, is causing a problem, who's responsible, I think, for, for funding and, and sort of greasing skids, if you will, because I think that's one of the fundamental questions here. If we're, if we're putting this together piecemeal every time, um, then it's not going to go much more smoothly than we did this time. And we, we, I think everybody, at least at least on this call, agrees that there hasn't been vaccine equity. So who's responsible for making sure that happens? And I'll throw in there that in any negotiation, the ability to take risk, which is having money to take risks for the most part, is fundamental to getting the outcome that you want. So how do you put sort of the global health purchasers on the same level as a country that has money to do a bilateral agreement to purchase all of the doses that they need? So I'll just throw that out there for the whole group. But Krishna, I know you have some ideas on this, thanks. Yeah. But I think I'm going to jump in there and talk from um, the perspective of working with CEPI on equitable access. And I think we've had a lot of challenges in CEPI. The principle was that CEPI was going to be looking at manufacturing vaccines ahead of time for outbreaks, not for pandemics. But when it came to flexibility and um, the ability to move funds fast when there was a pandemic occurring, SEPI was one of the first movers. And I think in many ways, the ways in which SEPI operates commit actually follow up on the equitable access commitments. But then the commitments cannot be met because CEPI is not the purchaser of the vaccines. So your question was really around who's responsible for buying, for delivering the vaccines, but that's not CEPI. So how do you get the partnerships that allow you to align the making of vaccines, the R&D to develop those vaccines with the delivery of vaccines? We have done somewhat better than the delivery of influenza vaccines for swine flu, which was our last big experience with WHO. But it really hasn't worked because maybe we were really naive about what it would take for international communities to come together. And would it have been, so let me turn that around and ask the question, would it have been different if it had been influenza? Where, they, where we know how to make pretty crummy vaccines, but we know how to make them. Here we had a pathogen that was completely new and that's why there was all this experimentation with every single platform that was available and why countries were lining up to make if they could afford it, um, commitments to buy many times the vaccine that would be required for the population because they didn't know what was going to work and what wasn't. So would we treat new pathogens differently from pandemics caused by known pathogens? Does someone let want to go? Well, answers? let 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 me weigh in first of all with with another observation, Cherry. If it had been influenza, actually, we might have come out better because one thing that we have learned from this pandemic is that you can actually stop influenza circulating simply by wearing a mask and keeping distance from other people because there's been almost zero influenza circulating for the last two years. So what used to keep me awake at night was pandemic influenza, because you know, pandemic influenza could, could be a lot worse. It could make COVID look like a walk in the park. But we've learned one thing about influenza, and that is masks and hand washing and, and distancing actually work. 
No. What a surprise that's been. Holy cow. That's <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, but, I mean, who that's would have thunk? Yeah, I would who, would, who would have thunk? Because I, I mean, but it's amazing. There's been zero influenza for two years now. Of course, we've all lost our immunity. So let's wait until <laughs> next winter and see what happens. But apart from that, I'm also pleased it wasn't influenza because most of our influenza vaccines are made with eggs. And of course, you don't just order eggs and say, you can have 10 million eggs tomorrow. You order that a year, a year or two years in advance. And the tissue culture production is insufficient. And again, it takes 10 years to build a tissue culture facility. So fortunately, it wasn't influenza. But your questions are good. How are we going to are we going to differentiate between new versus old? And to me, this comes back to what are regions going to build as facilities to be prepared for the next pandemic? What are they going to produce in those facilities? Because if you decide to produce, let's say, egg-based influenza vaccines, well, that's great for influenza. But if the next pathogen that comes along, you, your technology doesn't use eggs, you don't have anything except perhaps a filling line. And the filling line is already a good start. But if this is, requires us to have regional coherent, co cohesive strategies and coherent strategies about what is going to be built, what would that be able to respond to in the future? And this time we were lucky. Inactivated vaccines that worked, viral vector vaccines worked, recombinant proteins worked, mRNA worked, everything worked. Well, almost everything, there were a few failures. But the next time it might not be like that. I don't have the answer, I'm just realizing that I'm probably going to be in good acquaintances with the devil. So, but let me go back because I don't want to conflate two areas. On one hand, we talk about a COVID vaccine. We talk about a platform. We talk about the fact that a good portion of the world is still not vaccinated. We're talking about going in and having regional production. Hopefully that will increase access and fulfill that need. At some point, we have to deal with the issue about whether newer facilities will be able to be as cost effective as for profit facilities, whether or not they will simply, the for profit facilities will simply drop the price and be able to go in in a competitive way. But the other important issue is talking about emerging pathogens and new threats, which may in fact bring in a whole new set of innovation, perhaps new IP, perhaps new trade secrets and new rights, that part of that is going to depend on the market, about who's going to pay for that. Will it affect wealthy countries? Will it affect countries that cannot afford it? And in that case, how do we assure that the innovation for that gets funded? And where do we have that preparedness? Meaning for that world outside of COVID. And I think those are important issues because all of those interactions between private and public, both facilities and, um, and, 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 uh, and involvement all have to be dealt with those. But I think that's an issue that scares all of us for the next one. Mark, if I, if I may, you know, Please. it's interesting that we, we are reliving the kind of conversations that happened after the flu pandemic in 2009 and uh, from which stemmed some proposals that I think I'd like just to put back on the table. And, and, and uh, we need to think with what we know today versus how we knew vaccines uh, before 2020. I think there has been an enormous change and the enormous change is that we know, at least for protein-based vaccine, Pro vaccines that target a protein antigen, not a carbohydrate, that there is, there is a technology that is 100% a platform. In other words, if you know how to make a vaccine against COVID with messenger RNA, you know how to make a vaccine against any other protein encoded by nucleic acid. And it's exactly the same chemical entity, it's the same toxicology, it's the same quality control criteria, it's the same everything that makes it so complicated to make, for instance, a recombinant protein vaccine. And this is why recombinant protein vaccines are still lagging now from, against COVID as compared to messenger RNA. I, I do think the reality technologically has changed for probably quite a number of potential pathogens that we could now 
target by designing vaccine in a matter of designing, I mean, uh, in a matter of weeks or a few months and manufacturing them in a matter of a few months because the manufacturing process has been established. So there are possible solutions, frankly, or, or partial solutions, uh, not to localize in every country a vaccine design and manufacturing. But for instance, I, I made some proposals saying, you know, why don't we have a continent-based vaccine design and manufacturing center that designs out of the, the WHO list of potential uh, uh, pandemic agents, vaccines, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a concerted way, we'd have five such centers or four such centers. And in a concerted way, they go after each one of the potential pandemic pathogen, designing a vaccine, starting to manufacturing, manufact scale up the manufacturing up to even a million dose scale per batch uh, uh, because it's a technology that's so much the same. As you go from one vaccine to the next, to the next, to the next, you actually keep a manufacturing facility and talent and regulatory requirements and quality control validation, et cetera, warm without actually commercializing a vaccine, commercializing a vaccine. And I think industry will be in such setting, if it can be worked out, willing to transfer the IP and most critically the know-how and not only the know-how, to actually transfer the people that help with the tech transfer. I can tell you trying to do the tech transfer of just the you know, human adeno or, or the chimp adeno to, to scale the manufacturing facilities, equipped, et cetera, in the US fast was, was a disaster. Uh, with, with, with all barriers around talent, financing, equipment, access to raw material, et cetera, being frankly uh, put out of the table. So uh, I really think it's possible to have something that looks like the, uh, the uh, Security Council, let's say, call it the Global Health Security Council, that says, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna dedicate $5 billion a year or $10 billion a year, in other words, like a drop in the ocean on a worldwide basis to support four or five facilities that are designed to produce and design, test, manufacture at a reasonable scale, the next 50 or 70 potential pathogens. And if at any time point during the process, as they are running and warm, a new pandemic comes in, they will instantly be shifted. They're, tech, they're skilled in that platform technology usage and they, uh, they will be able to produce vaccine at a scale that can serve the continent or subcontinent they are based into. I think it can be worked out. I think one, if one wanted to bet on two platform technologies, can, one could do it. Uh, um, and you know, decide certain facilities are dedicated to messenger RNAs and other are dedicated, for instance, to a non-replicated virus, uh, replicating virus, I mean, real, the two real platform technologies. Um, I, think, I think those are possible and I think those are viable in relation to the businesses that have invested to create the platform technologies and will continue evolving them. Uh, because they because these facilities would not produce would not be producing vaccine for general use, right? They, they would be effective really in a pandemic setting. Sorry for being long, but no, no. So, are there any thoughts? I, he's it? reminded me so much of, and, and I'm not the one that came up with this phrase. I think it came from um, the Harvard Med School Task Force that that I was a member of. The missing conductor. Um, I mean, Montef served in many ways as sort of the con conductor for warp speed, but there is no global conductor of this enterprise, which is, is sort of pandemic ink or even global health product ink. 
So one thing is there's a missing conductor and how do you create that and how do you get a global agreement how that's going to work? And the second thing, back to IP, sorry, is much of the IP behind the COVID-19 vaccines came out of universities. I mean, the, the basic platform technologies and a lot of even the sort of delivery systems and lipids, they came out of university technologies. And at least my proposal would be that universities and governments, when technology is invented that might have a positive effect on global health, that there should be equitable access provisions built into those licenses from the beginning. Because um, to give CEPI another call out, it would make life for CEPI and probably the Gates Foundation and other public funders a lot simpler if there has already been a consideration of how the intellectual property can be preserved for the benefit of global health both emergencies, but fundamental care. So I think we need to start back with getting governments and intellectual property to agree terms to put into those initial funding agreements and licenses and development agreements that provide for the whole world to have access to the resulting products. Thanks. Can you, but can you go in and have, I mean, we're slicing this in multiple ways. Right now, there are proposals in the TRIPS waiver to go have an agreement for whatever it's based to say, this is going to provide more access. We, we've heard reasons why we think it may not. Is it better rather than coming up with a universal solution, rather meaning of meaning universal uh, way to be able to access this, these IPs, rather than coming out with specific solutions meaning on taking Monsef's idea, being able to say, okay, we want to do something only on specific platforms on a global basis for specifically for emergent pathogens and find waivers for those specifically rather than just having a whole waiver for the whole bag. I mean, are we being too grandiose? Is the solution in addressing the details of what we want to accomplish. I'm not sure that question was for me, Mark, but I will say it it's, be for harder, yeah. it's harder to solve a problem at the end than at the beginning. Um, and providing um, that governments, funders, uh, development organizations create a right in an agreement, maybe it's because I'm focused on contracts and agreements all of the time, but creating those things from the beginning. I mean, think how much easier it would have been for the US to donate doses if in its original development and purchase agreements, they provided for donation instead of having to go back to companies and get those rights so that they could donate that to other countries. There, it's easier to create these things at the beginning when you have leverage in those agreements than it is to fix them later on. Thanks. I, I totally agree with that. And uh, of course, the, the administration that was in place at the time was not thinking in, on that dimension. But, but that's, that's, I would say, frankly, in, in the big picture, that's more one item. I, I do think having been involved in the creation of CEPI and, and, and all the conversation around it and, and the discussions, that the, the the uh, access issues were the hardest issues to be discussed between all the parties involved in the creation of CEPI and, and, the, and the industry players. And if I look uh, into how companies look into those requirements when they try to access financing from CEPI or from the Gates Foundation, Scott, you can comment on this, it's usually quite a significant challenge. And, and, and remember, in, in, in the, particularly in the field of vaccine, on average, a vaccine is gonna have 10, 15, 20 patents over it before it can, it can go through. So uh, I, I, think it's, I think it is easier actually to make those requirements set for pandemic settings. And, and I think before the, this pandemic, 
industry, the big players could have had the, I don't know how to call it, something negative to say, no, I don't want to do it, right? But now after this pandemic, who can stand up and say, you know, I'm fine with 6 million people dying or the world closing down just because potentially I may make money. I do think there is, there is a more, much bigger leverage today to say, listen, there is on that list on WHO, there's 70 pathogens. None of you ever pronounced them and would know how to pronounce them. So those, those are commercially unattractive. They're only relevant in a pandemic setting. The only exception is flu. And flu, I think we need to deal with in, in some you know, alternative way until, until maybe messenger RNA shows they can make a, you know, potentially a better flu vaccine. But you know, I, I do think we need to rethink how, how, we, how we look at this, at this problem. I think it's technologically, it's now much more possible to, to spread technology on many different pathogens. And, and, and in a very binding way, restrict its use to only those pathogens that are commercially not attractive unless there is a pandemic and, and, and drive with the public opinion, et cetera, now the, the, the need to, to provide that access. Okay. And the companies will have resolved it anyway. They have access. So, so there is an opportunity pattern. now. We understand. There is an opportunity given what has happened. So how does, what do you want to see out of that process? There's more attention on vaccines, perhaps more funding, more of a recognition about the danger and need, more that's clear that not all of this is going to be all profit incentive, that there is a need for wider distribution, there's a need for equity. Given this time period now where people, you've gotten everyone's attention, what concrete steps do you want to see come out of it? I, I find it really um, inspiring to hear Monsef especially say that this is a tractable problem. So that, that's, that's great. And I, I wanted to come back, Mark, on your question to what Julie was asking, like, what about this missing conductor? Um, is uh, given that you know CEPI and COVAX, you know, acknowledged shortcomings during the pandemic, but um, is some combination of CEPI and COVAX potentially the missing conductor? Could they be involved to be that uh, missing conductor in the future? Um, what do you think? Clearly, please, please. Yeah. I think we should recognize that, um, first of all, a lot of the work that was done under COVAX and, and certainly under ACT Day more broadly was you know, crisis response in real time because we didn't have the systems and the structure going into the pandemic. Um, I think now is exactly the time when we should take some of those lessons learned and apply them to the rest of this pandemic and make us better prepared for whatever comes later. Um, you know, I think COVAX specifically, if we take a look, I'd say we are much better off with COVAX than we would have been without it in all likelihood, right? 1.4 billion doses out the door uh, to some of the poorest countries in the world that otherwise wouldn't have likely gotten access on a, in a market-based system. Um, that said, there are no shortage of improvements that are feasible. And so I think the real question is, where's the process by which we can systematically and, and in a blame-free way look at what went well, what lessons we should learn for improvement and get to the next level of, uh, of what our response really should be from a multilateral perspective. And I think that goes for ACT-A as well. Um, some of this comes down to governance. Some of this comes down to financing. I think very quickly there was a decision made not to stand up some new entity. Uh, I'm not sure that would have worked even if somebody tried to do it, but ACT-A and even COVAX as a partnership where we had three, four, and in the level of Act A, you know, 10 or more organizations come together to coordinate, but not joint decision-making. So I think that to me is at one place we, we have to understand uh, what's the decision-making that's needed in a crisis and is a distributed model the one that works best. Secondly, how do we line up financing? We're two years into the pandemic, still passing the hat, hoping that we can raise enough money. And we're talking about raising billions of dollars 
when we're seeing trillions of dollars of economic impact. The, the G7 countries um, were able to deploy more than $11 trillion in response to their own health and economic needs. Last year, the Act A budget request um, received about 18 billion, leaving a gap of 14 billion. This year, we're already um, six months into the year of the request. The, the grant request is about 16 uh, billion dollars of which less than two has even been committed. And this is not for next year, this is for the year we're in. Uh, we're seeing desperately uh, calls from, from all of the leadership that the, even the current response, which is inadequate, cannot continue at the current funding levels. And it's not just on a global perspective, we can bring this back to the US. Uh, the Biden administration is saying pretty clearly, including yesterday and today in the press, that the global response cannot continue unless there's supplemental funding that's, um, that doesn't seem to be underway right now. So we've got to find both a governance model that can work based on lessons learned, but we also have to figure out a financing model that's not trying to raise money little by little in real time. And, I and to me, that was part of the challenge that COVAX had. You had people that stepped up in because nobody was in charge, going back to one of the prior questions. When nobody was in charge, it became, okay, I'll step up and, and, and try it in the case of WHO, Gavi, and CEPI, and later UNICEF as well. Um, but we didn't have any financing mechanism to support it. So part of the reason COVAX was at the back of the line for making purchases and getting deliveries is because they didn't bring the money to the table on day one and couldn't make purchases uh, as quickly as high-income countries could. Any other comments? Martin? Okay. Um, look, I think I agree with a lot of what's been said, but again, the devil is in the details. So I get, I just can't help but get me feeling that we are, dis this discussion is very North-centric, okay? We're not really here taking into account the, the desires, the wishes of the low and middle income countries. And what I certainly am hearing from them is a desire for autonomy, to be empowered. So while I fully agree with, and I would never disagree with Monsef, I, everything I know about vaccines, I think Monsef taught me. So I agree with Monsef's plans, but what we are hearing from countries is the desire for regional autonomy. And it's not only regional autonomy to be able to respond in the future, but it's regional autonomy to be empowered. So this brings me back to what I was saying right at the beginning. You know, the know-how, that, that can be managed. You know, even mRNA, there's now, what, 25 biotech companies that are in phase one or phase two with next generation mRNAs that either bypass or circumvent existing IP, whatever the case is going to be. So know-how is not a problem. IP, I really think, isn't a problem. Uh, there's been a comment in, in the chat, you know, the waiver, you know, quite a lot of people support the waiver. I think it would be good to hear comments about in support of the waiver. Um, I, the only challenge I see with the waiver is, is how, how does this match with sustainability? Because it's, it's short-term, it's not long-term. But I want to come back to this. Yes, we can build facilities that would, that would be theoretically ready, but how do we make sure that the staff in those facilities remain ready? And this means that they're going to be producing something that they sell. And what is that thing that they sell? And how, does they, how do they sell it? If it's more expensive than that can be, which can be produced from India or Korea or, or France or Belgium. And this then brings us back to what was said previously that the, this all comes down to market shaping and ensuring that in these regions, there is a commitment to procure regionally. So we're going around in circles, sorry, but um, that's my conclusion. No, so let me ask you this, because you, you hit on something and try to go get it from North Central to more to Central. We talked about the need for access, the need for equity, the access to be able to have necessary vaccines to all people to respond to innovations, no matter where that comes from. But you mentioned something else that I think we should also discuss, which is, which is also behind a lot of the need for local facilities, and that's the need for autonomy. And how do you, are you able to reconcile the need for local autonomy by countries who don't have, have that, who are dependent on just buying all their services 
with what may well be a more difficult process, more details all across the board in everything that we mentioned, not only in terms of trade secrets, proprietary rights, IP, but tech and talent transfer, and maybe higher costs with a need to say now, we need to do it on our own. We can't just go be increasingly indebted to the rest of the world to do it. Because somewhere along the line, there are a lot of initiatives that are, are, are based on that need for local autonomy. And I think you're right. We need to confront that, whether or not that needs to be, you know, that can be resolved or not. So let me just a short answer to that. And to come back to a word that Mons have used, it's, it's regional facilities or sub-regional, subcontinental facilities. So that is part of this. But this is going to require that if there's a subcontinental procurement mechanism, that countries actually agree that we're going to produce vaccines in country X and country Y and Z and A and B, whatever it's going to be, are going to procure from them. That works very well while you still remember the pandemic. But then the Minister of Health changes and suddenly we're going to, I'm going to be getting that same phone call. Can you please tell me why I'm paying $6 for this vaccine when I can buy it from somebody else for $3? And this then brings us back to this commitment to long-term regional health security and the recognition that this costs money and that you cannot get regional health security for free. Cherry, let me go, no, Cherry, let me go back to you. Back, almost back to the original question. So much of a need for local autonomy. You look at what was built over 20 years to build and you look at how do you reconcile that need? The fact that there are areas of countries who say, you know what, I don't want money. I don't want to pay for money, whatever it is to leave my country. This is something that I can do with the reality of, because for many of these vaccines go beyond COVID. They go beyond to ones that are existing. H how do you look at that? How can that be reconciled? I think if you think from an LMIC perspective, by and large preventive strategies have been for the government to provide. And in the early days, certainly when I was a child, the government made all the vaccines that it provided to us. What changed with the coming of the serum institutes and the BioEase, which were small players and increased with time, was the fact that they brought a quality standard that had not previously been available. The government no longer invested in maintaining the infrastructure that it had, and we wound up in a very different situation over a period of decades. Now, if we think about what the world looks like going forward, there's always security when the government is responsible for making and providing vaccines. But that has not been a model that has been tenable except in a very few countries. Vietnam does it to some extent. China has government facilities that do it to some extent. Most of them tend to rely on technologies that are old. So if you are facing forward and thinking about newer technologies, technologies that may not even exist today to handle future outbreaks and pandemics, then I think building the kinds of Structures that are required in LMICs requires investment that is not normally made in health without donor support. So how do you, you know, Monsef's argument about this needs to be like thinking about security in other senses makes a lot of sense to a public health practitioner, but doesn't make sense to a government. So I, I'm not sure that there are easy solutions or any one pattern that could be followed for this. No, and it goes back to Scott's comment, which is certainly true that everyone mentioned, in all areas beyond vaccines of global health security, governance is an issue. There is no overall governance. 
per se that deals with many of these issues. So clearly it's not going to be that here and it takes a huge amount of collaboration. Before we get on, is there a model? Because one thing is clear, everything we talk about is going to require in some way the involvement needs permissions, the enabling of the private sector. Are there models that you've seen where that in fact has worked? Where that has worked and can a purely nonprofit facility or purely nationalist facility work without involvement or partnership with a for-profit entity? Mark, can I just give a background information because I think it's really relevant to, to that question. As you know, I was chairing the vaccine business of a large company. 80% of the profit of the vaccine business is made in seven or eight countries that are the likes of the US, Japan, Canada, Germany, right, the UK. However, without, without being able to commercialize 80 or 90% of the volume of a given vaccine in the world, that 80% profit would never be achieved. Let me explain. If I build a manufacturing facility that is able to make 20 million doses of vaccine, I'll have exactly the problem that was described before, which is each dose is gonna cost $20. But if I now make a manufacturing facility that can make 200 million doses of vaccine, my actual cost of goods per dose of vaccine is gonna be $1. And I'm gonna be able to sell the two, you know, 180 million of the 200 million doses at $2 a dose in an accessible way because that enables me to have a huge margin in the countries that can afford a much higher price. And that's really the, the model that uh, for quite a number of vaccine uh, in, in the case of the non-US centric uh, vaccine manufacturer is, is, uh, is maintaining, if you wish, the model, which is actually it's a symbiosis between producing very large volume of vaccine that you price low. And, and, I, and I think there are opportunities to negotiate there. I'm, I'm not that world anymore, but right. Uh, and you continue to make a profit and invest in generating novel vaccines. But the issue that has happened with, with frankly, very too, too small an organization is that the cost of discovering, developing, and, and testing a, a novel vaccine against a particular disease is prohibitive for an organization whose volume is gonna be 100 million doses of vaccine a year. Uh, I, I think so it comes back to that issue of sustainability. And um, anyway, I wanted to share that, that background because we just need, we need to be pragmatic. Uh, uh, and I'm not at all here talking about uh, something that's really, uh, I think very sensitive and, and, and complex, but, but that we should face, which is perceived quality of the vaccine uh, 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 when it's manufactured and, and distributed. That is an answer to the question. Can you go in and have solutions that don't actively involve the for-profit world? Are there models Car that you can do it on a purely non-profit or purely nationalistic basis? I think it's a, it's a hard question, but it's one that... That's why the focus on the non-commercially attractive pathogen market, that's, that's really... Where, where you can find a common ground between investors who invest in technologies and want to have a return where there is a market and a situation where there is no market until there is a pandemic. And, and of course, some things will need to be negotiated and discussed there. But I, I do think it, it kind of uh, confines the challenge to a much smaller problem than if you want to now undo the market for vaccines across the world That's good. for all vaccines. Yeah. Scott, any thoughts about 
looking at the responsiveness to new pathogens as a different model or solution than what we do for COVID or existing vaccines that are out there now. Yeah, I was I was thinking about the earlier analogy again. Back to the military thing that um, every country um, invests in an army, or nearly every country invests in an army. But it would be crazy to think that every country should have facilities to build F-16 jet fighters. Um, that that uh, that that wouldn't make sense. <clears throat> Back to this this question about who should be responsible. I fundamentally. Uh, that's what people have governments for. People have governments to protect them. And governments are going to be held accountable for protecting people. And I think this is where, Martin, when you raise this issue about um, what about uh, the global south and what are we hearing, we are definitely hearing people, uh, countries saying, we must have domestic manufacturing. We, we hear all this stuff about how complicated it is and how impractical and expensive, but we're doing it anyway, we're, pro, pro, we're proceeding anyway. And I think that's because in the wake of the pandemic, governments are feeling that their populations are going to hold them accountable for protecting them the next time. And that, that, that the next time, if the government says, well, sorry, we don't have the ability to get the vaccine, it's stuck, you know, India has nationalized and won't export or we can't afford the vaccines from Pfizer, that's not gonna be an acceptable excuse. And so um, that, that kind of brings me back to how, how do we accommodate that um, un unchangeable uh, pressure for countries to uh, protect their own people by ensuring that they have some, some answer to domestic manufacturing regardless of how, how complicated it is. And I think the regional solutions are great or possible, but I, I don't think they'll supplant uh, countries' desire to have, uh, and, and we have control over this in, in, in our country as well. I don't know what other people think, because I think we, we have been drifting a bit towards talking about global solutions that rely on regional centers, which makes total sense when you think about the global picture, but what we're hearing from country leaders is that's all fine, but we need, we need to assure that even in, whether it's Uganda or Zimbabwe, you know, a yeah. small country, we have to be able to control that because our people will expect us the next time to deliver vaccines to them. And in that case, clearly the devil is in the details for them. And uh, how you, are you able to be able to do that so that it's going to be when funded a successful initiative and not one that is going to end up with an empty infrastructure. Uh, I think we've laid out some of the issues. Let me go around and see if there are any final comments that people may have. I know we covered a lot of areas. I don't know whether we've accomplished anything. I do think we can put a light on some of the real hard issues that are out there. Um, and there are many of them that are there. That are there. So I do think it's not a kind of typical conversation that people do to say, well, my God, we need to go in and have a facility in every country to do every vaccine, or to go in and say, we just need to get more funding, or to go say, let's get rid of all patents. We have to deal with the practicalities and the details involved um, because we do have an opportunity. So if it's okay with everyone, let me just go around and see if there are any final thoughts. Kumar, you're on top over on my screen. Any, any other comments or final comments? Sure. First, thanks, Mark, for the opportunity to join you and, and all the fantastic speakers as well. Um, I think it's been a rich conversation on, on many topics. I would just perhaps um, add as a, as a closing comment, while we recognize that it's not easy um, and it's going to be complicated and it's going to take some time, say part of what's been missing is the political will and commitment that we're going to find a solution. And that's what we really need to see at all levels. Secondly, I would emphasize again, we absolutely need stronger leadership and roles for leaders from low and middle income countries that should be driving these decisions in the future. Um, and third, I would say the opportunity we have is there's a bit of a natural experiment playing out. We're trying lots of different models. Uh, I don't think there's a single path forward that's right and one that's wrong. What we need to do is learn from all of these efforts and take even more shots on goal 
right? Well, this has to be a portfolio approach the same way that vaccine development was a portfolio approach. Let's see what works and let's continue to invest in areas where we're seeing bright spots emerge and see what we can scale from those. So I uh, see the challenges ahead, but optimistic in seeing at least early signs of progress. So thank you. Great, thank you. Sherry, any thoughts? So I think one of the important things we have to recognize is that we went from about 4 billion doses of vaccine to 11 billion doses directed at one target. And I think there are lots of opportunities for prevention of disease through vaccination. This is a very real opportunity for us to build people which I think are going to be absolutely critical for the future to be able to make all of these vaccines as well as the places where these vaccines can be made. There are lots of opportunities and a lot of them could be located in low and middle income countries if we can align systems to make that happen. The WHO is making a start, but there is a lot more that can be done. Great. Reshma, thank you. Do you have any final thoughts as an operator? I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts about what you've heard today. Um, any no. comments you'd like to add? No, I thought it was, a, a, as a, Kumar said, a very rich discussion. And I think, you know, this idea of sort of pairing the demand side, right, ensuring that the purchase contracts or the long-term commitments are in place to you know, building on the latest technologies that really allow you not to just address a single pathogen, but really um, you know, a whole um, suite of emerging pathogens, I think is key to kind of the way forward um, if we're gonna sort of break through uh, some of these challenges we're facing. Great, Rashmi, thank you. Monsef? Sorry. Uh, well, first, really very interesting uh, and rich conversation. I, I would say two things. One is in front of very complex and emotionally charged issues, it's always very important to have the courage to bring pragmatism. <clears throat> because, and that's the second point, the worst thing we can do as a community is spend a lot of time talking and not acting. And I think... I do think uh, there were, I remember every day, a hundred experts explaining why vaccines against COVID will never be done within a few months. Uh, and we could have spent our life discussing why indeed they would not be done within a few months, or we could have jumped and tried. And, uh, and that's the right thing to do, I think but of course comes with a risk of failure. And the reason I say this is I, I really think in French, there is a saying that say, you have, to, you have to build the metal when it's really hot because it's the only chance to bend it. I do think we are in that situation. Post pandemic, there, is, there are opportunities in, in terms of accessing technologies and accessing funding and driving through solutions that are pragmatic they may not address the full problem at once but they will start you know uh, the process and I, and I hope I hope we, you know I'm encouraged that this this is possible but okay. thanks very much no thank you Martin okay um so let me just point out that a lot of countries in the north the West, whatever you want to call it, are suddenly saying, we need to be making our own face masks, or we need to be producing our own energy. We need to be producing our own X, Ys, and Zs. And this is going to come at a higher cost. So I think we've gone through the phase of having everything as cheap as possible because it was produced in central places. Monsef is absolutely right. There's a huge economy of scale in vaccines and for many other things. And as countries want autonomy, this is going to have to come with the recognition that there's going to be an added price to it. But if we don't do it now, we won't do it ever. This is now the right moment to start. Some will fail, that we can guarantee, but a few will survive. And I think we've got to move on that.
Martin, thank you. Scott? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been inspired by the opportunities and challenges also, the, you know, opportunities like Monsef pointed out, mRNA technology. Wow, uh, so many opportunities with that. And plus, um, this sort of drive from countries and others to expand and, and um, uh, vaccine manufacturing capability. I mean, that th opens potential new doors, even though there are these challenges with uh, costs and practicality that we've, we've uh, highlight, highlighted. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking to myself, you know, where can the Gates Foundation grease the skids here and there amongst the much bigger partners of governments and uh, private industry? Uh, we're, we're, we're a small player, but uh, where are the opportunities to, to make this uh, work a little bit more smoothly? So it's, it's been good to talk with you all. Listen, thank you everyone for participating uh, today, um, for having a conversation about what I think are some difficult issues. There is an opportunity today that was not there. All of you have been involved in this three, four, five years ago because we've seen what's happened. But we need to be realistic. We need to go in and engage the devil. I'm sorry that we've taken this metaphor so far, but we do need to know the details. We need to see if we're going to go spend money. Forget it. It's not even the money. If we spend the political capital, and we spend the opportunity, it has to work, or at least it has to have the best odds of working. And we have to give some real serious thought to learn from past successes and past failures and be able to go make realistic contributions now that there's an appreciation of the need, which may not have been there all that time. So I thank you. I think. We're going to leave a few minutes late. Joe, are you going to, I'm going to introduce Joe, who's going to take us on to the final part. I just want to personally thank everyone for taking part, if you will, in this experiment. I don't know whether you've done a two-hour Zoom conversation in front of a live audience before, but if not, it'll be an interesting model to try to do again. But I thank all of you. You've all been great. Joe, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank sure. you. Thanks, Dr. Grodman. I'm Jill Wick. I'm the Director of Digital Strategy and Marketing here at Columbia University Irving Medical Center in New York City. Um, and before we acknowledge all those who've made this possible, this event possible, uh, just a note that today is National Doctors' Day here in the U.S. Um, so I want to recognize all of the physicians out there. You've heroically led us through the pandemic and um, you've sacrificed more than we could ever hope to ask for. So please know how much you are appreciated today and every day. Um, that same appreciation goes for all of our experts on the panel um, for day three. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us, um, the wonderful and insightful discussion and really sticking with that metaphor, it shows dedication. Um, thank you to the Grodman Family Foundation and Pfizer for generously supporting the symposium. Um, our external partners, the Atlantic Fellows, the Rhodes Trust, and the Schmidt Science Fellows, and our internal partners, uh, the Vaccine Safety and Confidence Building Working Group, uh, also known as VaxSafe, the Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy, ISERP, and finally, everyone at Columbia University. Um, so please be sure to join us again tomorrow at noon for day four. Our experts are going to be discussing trust in science influencers and funding when it comes to the social psychology of vaccine resistance. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you tomorrow.